Humankind is produced in association with WGBH Boston and supported by the Humankind Program Fund. They were mocked, ridiculed, beaten. Sometimes they were clubbed and kicked and slapped. How some conscientious objectors were treated in America during the horrors of World War I. You're listening to Humankind. I'm David Freudberg. As we remember the dark years of the First World War a century ago, one fascinating chapter of history has received little attention. The fate of 65,000 American men who applied for conscientious objector status because they opposed war on moral grounds. Historian Scott Bennett edited Anti-War Dissent and Peace Activism in World War I America. I wasn't particularly interested in pacifism when I first started working on, on this project. I always believed that pacifism and nonviolence, in fact, were quite irrelevant and simply didn't have the kind of the realism to confront the, 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 the very difficult problems and conflicts in the world. But as I began to um, read a little bit, I realized that these radical pacifist groups believed in using active types of nonviolence and active types of nonviolent resistance to confront conflict and aggression and dictatorships and so on. So that's the point that it began to really interest me. By any measure, World War I was an unmitigated human catastrophe. Estimated 16 million soldiers and civilians died on and around the bloody battlefields of Europe. Some of the fallen combatants could not be identified, and their gravestones bear the phrase, a soldier of the great war, known unto God. Of the survivors, some were emotionally devastated by shell shock, a condition known today as post-traumatic stress, the story of war-weary soldiers was dramatized in the 1930 Academy Award-winning film All Quiet on the Western Front. I'll tell you how it should all be done. Whenever there's a big war coming on, you should rope off a big field... And sell and, tickets. Yeah. And on the big day, you should take all the kings and their cabinets and their generals, put them in the center dressed in their underpants, and let them fight it out with clubs. The best country wins. Right. The Great War introduced the age of industrialized slaughter. For the first time, bombs were dropped from a new technology known as airplanes rapid-fire weapon called the machine gun, capable of mowing down entire columns of people in seconds, was deployed on a mass scale. And World War I initiated the modern era of chemical warfare through use of an agent known as mustard gas, which produced bleeding in the respiratory system and large blisters on skin that were so painful they could not be bandaged or touched. Scott Bennett. The war began um, in August 1914. And so from August 1914 until April 1917, the U.S. was um, quote-unquote neutral. The U.S. had not directly intervened in the war, though the U.S. was involved in the war by um, supplying the Allies. For that period of time, um, most Americans uh, probably did not want the United States to intervene. There was a very strong anti-interventionist mood. Um, that began to change um, when the Germans uh, embarked on, on submarine warfare, and particularly the sinking of the Lusitania in May 1915 with the loss of over 1,000 folks, including over 100 Americans. Uh, um, and, and in the North Sea, the, both the Germans and the British had mined um, the sea to attempt to blockade um, shipping from reaching each other's ports. And they also had submarine patrols on the part of the, on the Germans. 
and so they sank um, this British ship that was carrying passengers, but also carrying, um, you know, goods that could be used for the war. And that was a turning point in uh, American public sentiment about World War I? Yes, it was. I mean, there were others, of course. Obviously, the initial German invasion of neutral Belgium, uh, with all the propaganda surrounding that, the rape of Belgium. There was the famous Zimmermann telegram, where the Germans tried to persuade Mexico to go to war against the United States, and if the Germans and the Mexicans won, the Mexicans would um, get back the land that they had lost to the United States in the 1844-46 Mexican War. And so all of these things helped to slowly shift American opinion uh, towards a willingness to intervene. The call to battle was sounded in 1917 by Ohio Senator Warren G. Harding, who three years later would be elected president. If Italy should yield to the pressure of military might, if heroic France should be martyred on her flaming altars of liberty and justice and only the soul of heroism remain, if England should starve and her sacrifices and resolute warfare should prove in vain, if all these improbable disasters should attend, even then we should fight on and on, making the world's cause our cause. On April 6, 1917, the United States declared war on Germany and formally entered the Great War. Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them calling you and me. Every son of liberty. Hurry right away, no delay, go today. Make your daddy glad to have had such a lad. Tell your sweetheart not to pine, to be proud her boy's in line. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there, that the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums rum coming everywhere. So Tell us about conscientious objection during the Great War. What was the legal status at that point of people who refused on moral grounds to participate in the war effort? The government, the U.S. government, had passed the Selective Service Law in, in May 1917. And this law did recognize conscientious objection, but it limited conscientious objection uh, to religious pacifists, and mainly to religious pacifists in what we call the historic peace churches, uh, the Quakers, the Mennonites, and the Brethren, in other smaller churches who had well-recognized creeds that forbade uh, their fighting or participating in military conflict. The law did not cover secular or political objectors. And the law also said that if you were recognized as a CO, you still had to serve in the military in a non-combatant role. 65,000 men sought conscientious objection status. So what was the process before someone would be officially approved as an objector? The president uh, set up a local draft board in each county of the country. In larger cities, um, New York City, for instance, or Chicago, um, Boston, there would be more than one local draft board. I, I believe it was roughly one local draft board for every 30,000 people. So the young man, um, the objector, would, would appear before his local draft board and essentially present you know, credentials, uh, some type of evidence, some type of testimony, that persuaded the, the local draft board that he, in fact, was sincere. Uh, and then the board, um, you know, made a determination after hearing that. So what did that consist of to prove that a person was a genuine conscientious objector, a person 
who objected to war on moral grounds. I, I would just say the key is that you're objecting on religious grounds. You might typically um, have a, an affidavit from your, your local minister, for instance, or you might be able to prove that you attended a particular church that was, uh, whose creed was uh, opposed to your service in, in the military. It would be that type of evidence that the, the boards would look for primarily. If for some reason you didn't have that, um, then perhaps a neighbor or a friend would testify that, that in fact you, you, you were a member of this church or this faith and these principles you did in fact hold. So under the selective service law, if a person had a non-religious but s- sincere moral objection to warfare, that, that wouldn't suffice? Out of luck. Um, you, you, you would not be granted uh, CO status. The principle of conscientious objection by members of pacifist religious groups was recognized as early as colonial America. When the nation's first military draft was imposed during the Civil War, the government permitted conscientious objection in some cases. Then, and in World War I, the large majority of conscientious objectors derived their beliefs from spiritual conviction. They took to heart the Ten Commandments' moral imperative, Thou shalt not kill. Some of the churches that these objectors came from were were groups like the Quakers or, or the Friends, uh, the Mennonites, the Brethren, the Molochons, the Dunkards, the Hutterites, Jehovah Witnesses, who at that time were called Russellites, and a number of other fairly small and somewhat obscure sects, but all had a principled um, opposition to war. These religious CEOs, they comprised, um, I'm not sure, maybe 75 percent, you know, the, 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 uh, of, the, of the objectors. It, it, was, it was an overwhelming majority. But then you had another group that we, we classify as political and humanitarian objectors. And most of these were socialist in the broadest sense of the word. So members of the Socialist Party members of the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, anarchists, and a whole variety of um, independent radicals. These were people who argued that the war in large part was based on um, economic grounds, that it was a capitalist war fought by nations and fought by capitalists to make profits and it would be the workers who would fight and who would die. So those are the the two largest groups. During World War I, a total of 65,000 American men asked to be excused from combat as conscientious objectors. Local draft boards certified nearly 9 in 10 of them as legitimate. Nearly half of this group failed the Army physical and so were not called up. 21,000 COs were ultimately inducted into the Army. We're talking with Scott Bennett, a professor of history at Georgian Court University and editor of Anti-War Dissent and Peace Activism in World War I America. You're listening to Humankind. I'm David Freudberg. For more information on this segment, Conscientious Objectors, to learn more about the history of war resistance during World War I, and to obtain an audio copy, please check our website, humanmedia.org. Sixty-five thousand people in the 19 teens was not an insignificant number of Americans applying for conscientious objector status. How did the public in general respond to the emergence of conscientious objectors? I would say overall quite quite negatively. Now, I do think that um, certainly liberal opinion, for instance, probably uh, was not particularly hostile towards some groups of 
religious objectors, particularly folks like Quakers who were kind of fairly modernist and, and well-educated and could present their case. Um, but for the most part, there was enormous hostility. And uh, this is very easy to kind of gauge because um, objectors were, were poorly treated, both by civilians and in the military. Um, they, were, they were jeered. Uh, partly because they didn't understand them, particularly those uh, who were, for instance, Mennonites or Brethren or Hutterites, folks whose tradition seemed strange, folks who, once they got uh, drafted and found themselves in army camps, refused any cooperation with the military, refused to don a military uniform, for instance. They were painted as uh, cowards? They were painted as cowards, and they also were painted as as often kind of foreigners in the sense that many of these um, church groups uh, had come out of uh, uh, the German Reformation of the 16th century. And so, of course, they were American citizens, and they had lived in America in some cases for generations, but they still had Germanic names which, of course, made them suspect. Because the war was being fought against Germany. Because the war was being fought against Germany. And in the United States, there was um, a concerted attempt to kind of build a campaign of 100 percent patriotism, 100 percent Americanism. In 1917, the year the United States entered the war against Germany, the former American ambassador there, James W. Girard, publicly raised the question of loyalty by Americans of German ancestry. And if there are any German Americans here who are so ungrateful for all the benefits they have received that they are still for the Kaiser, there is only one thing to do with them, and that is to hug tie them, give them back the wooden shoes and the rags they landed in, and ship them back to the fatherland. Persecution of Americans whose families had immigrated from the country the United States was at war with also played out in World War II. More than 100,000 Japanese-American citizens were ordered removed from their homes in 1942, shortly after the Empire of Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. They were sent to government-run internment camps under direction of a federal agency called the War Relocation Authority. But in World War I, German Americans faced a different kind of challenge. People were harassed, uh, assaulted. Uh, sometimes they were tarred and feathered. Um, they were beaten. Uh, now, you know, this is not every single person, but, but there, are, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of cases of this occurring across the country. And you're saying that that prejudice kind of seeped into public perception of conscientious objectors as a whole. I think it did. Um, you remember that even in the United States after 9-11, the U.S. Senate in their dining room renamed French fries, freedom fries, <laughs> because the French had um, criticized U.S. intervention, the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Well, in World War I, um, things were renamed. Hamburger was renamed. Um, um, sauerkraut um, was not served in, in schools. German was dropped from school curriculums and things such as that. In this atmosphere of passionate nationalism and patriotism, more than four million Americans were called into the army. 116,000 of them would die in the war, and more than 200,000 others would come home wounded. And even for those who survived intact, military service was a daily grind, a reality laid bare by Irving Berlin's hugely popular 1918 song. The vast majority of American forces mobilized in World War I would prepare for battle. 
But the more than 20,000 inducted as conscientious objectors were directed to perform non-combat duty. Historian Scott Bennett. You're ordered to report to a camp, so uh, maybe Camp Upton on Long Island or Camp Lewis or Camp uh, Riley or, um, you know, there were, there were several dozen of these camps. They were all across the country. And these camps uh, were not only for COs. The camps also received uh, ordinary um, men who had been drafted who were being trained uh, for military service. So both the objectors and the ordinary draftees were together in the same camps. So did did that produce tension between those it, two groups? It did produce tension. Um, um, the initial orders were that the objectors were to be segregated um, until they could be sorted out. Uh, and this is where it depended on the type of commander. Uh, some camp commanders were quite sympathetic. They were quite tolerant, um, understanding. And in those cases, there really weren't, um, you know, many problems. Uh, unfortunately, other camps were led by officers who were uh, very, very intolerant. And, and, of course, the officers under them acted out in that way. So, for instance, um, COs were regularly, uh, they were mocked, ridiculed, uh, beaten. Uh, sometimes they were clubbed and kicked and slapped. Uh, sometimes they were jabbed with bayonets to kind of prod them to move from place to place. They were stripped. Uh, and given cold showers and scrubbed with very stiff brushes that, that, you know, kind of tore some of their skin off. They were dunked in latrines, sometimes held by their heels and face down, dunked into kind of uh, dung pits, uh, so they were covered with excrement. Uh, in other cases, they had ropes uh, fastened around their necks and they were pulled from place to place. Um, many of these objectors, uh, at least some of the religious ones, had very long beards. They, they believed that, you know, their beard should not be cut. It was, a, it was a religious duty, and they were kind of pulled by their beards, or sometimes their beards were cut um, to kind of shame them. And uh, in places where it was cold, they were often forced to take cold, icy showers once or twice a day. And, um, and again, something that has come up recently, in some cases they were subjected to a water, a water torture, not unlike what we call waterboarding today, where they were held down and a, a hose, um, you know, directed water into their, into their mouth, and then somebody would stomp on their stomach and so on. Um, so a semblance of, of drowning, very painful. Another technique, I might add, that when, when COs refused to obey orders, they often were sent to what is called the hole, a kind of solitary confinement, and they were handcuffed or shackled to their cell doors for nine hours a day. So they would stand there with their hands shackled to the cell uh, under the theory that nine hours represented a full day's work the day's work that they refused to do. And that was a very, very common uh, punishment until December um, 1918, when it was finally abolished by President Wilson. Those who had received harshest treatment included hundreds of COs, sometimes called absolutists, who felt that any cooperation with organized violence was immoral and who therefore defied the instructions of their military officers and were sent to prison. At the same time, about four out of five COs found their stance too difficult to maintain. They relented under pressure and ultimately agreed to take up arms. But about 4,000 maintained their stance on principle. How did all this affect the way Americans viewed the next major military event, the outbreak of World War II? Many of these COs during World War I 
when they found themselves in these camps and in these military prisons, they staged a whole variety of hunger strikes and work strikes and nonviolent non-cooperation to protest the conditions under which they lived, to protest the abuse, to protest the treatment, the regimentation, and so on. Uh, these objectors made life very difficult for the U.S. Army. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. President Franklin Roosevelt addressing Congress the day after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost. In addition, American ships have been reported torpedoed on the high seas between San Francisco and Honolulu. So when World War II comes around, and the law was being discussed and debated in Congress, pacifists and COs were successfully able to lobby for a different type of law. It broadened the religious test. And, and the second element that pacifists won in World War II, they had the right to do civilian work of national importance. They did not have that option in World War I. The only option really was to join the military and do non-combatant work. In World War II, uh, a program called Civilian Public Service was set up. 151 civilian public service camps across the country where COs could do various types of civilian work. And in fact, some 12,000 COs worked in those camps during World War II. What, what kind of work was done there? A huge variety, um, conservation and reforestation, work that was done in rural areas, planting trees, digging irrigation ditches and so on. Um, some COs did work in uh, mental institutions, mental hospitals. The, 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 the regular orderlies uh, had been drafted or had enlisted in the military. And so these hospitals uh, were shorthanded, and COs took those jobs and did them with uh, much more understanding and tenderness towards the inmates uh, than had often been, often been previously shown. Scott Bennett, professor of history at Georgian Court University and editor of Anti-War Dissent and Peace Activism in World War I America. Listening to Humankind, I'm David Freudberg. Studio recording by Antonio Oliart Rose. Editorial assistance from Kathy Graham, Ken Rogers, and Mark Kilstein. Webmaster Brian K. Johnson. Special thanks to Bond Collard, Adam Staniszewski, and Tony Buck. Our program is presented by Human Media in association with Connie Goldman Productions. Program development provided by Shart Media. To purchase a CD copy of this program, please call 1-800-5-LISTEN. That's 1-800-5-L-I-S-T-E-N. Or visit our website where you can also obtain an audio download of this and our other programs and can hear selected episodes free. You can access free written materials related to this program as well. Our web address is humanmedia.org. Again, if you'd like to purchase a CD copy of Humankind by phone, please call 1-800-5-LISTEN, and our web address is humanmedia.org. This segment, Conscientious Objectors, is Humankind Program number 215. The executive producer is David Freudberg. This is Humankind.